So in the bulletin, you'll see a passage of scripture listed as a scripture reading. Now, we will be reading that passage of scripture, but I just won't be beginning with it today. Um, it's going to begin by telling you that uh, this past week, uh, Grace and the kids and I have been celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles by camping out at Moss Park. Uh, Kim asked for prayer for those that are camping out there um, because... As you can see, there's heavy rain, and most of us are sleeping in tents out there. So I tried to protect our stuff before we left so that it would be dry when we return. So hopefully the tents are still standing, and everything will be dry when we uh, go back out um, this afternoon. Uh, but the reason my family observes this appointed time is found in Leviticus 23, verses 33 through 44. So I'm going to begin by reading uh, those verses to you. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of the seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days to the Lord. On the first day they sh there shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. For seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. On the eighth day you shall have a holy convocation, and you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. It is a sacred assembly, and you shall do no customary work on it. These are the feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, to offer an offering made by fire to the Lord, a burnt offering and a grain offering, a sacrifice and drink offerings, everything on its day. Besides the Sabbaths of the Lord, besides your gifts, besides all your vows, and besides all your free will offerings which you give to the Lord. Also on the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep the feast of the Lord for seven days. On the first day there shall be a Sabbath rest, and on the eighth day a Sabbath rest. And you shall take for yourselves on the first day the fruit of beautiful trees, branches of palm trees, the boughs of leafy trees and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. You shall keep it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All who are native Israelites shall dwell in booths, that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So Moses declared to the children of Israel the feasts of the Lord. So I'm aware that many Christians do not celebrate this feast, and I've heard all the reasons why they don't. Um, I didn't celebrate the, the feast at all until uh, really it's been in the last 10 years that we've really attempted to, uh, but the number one reason that I hear is that it is a Jewish feast and Christians aren't Jewish. Now, if you go back to Leviticus 23, verse 2, it says, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, The feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, these are my feasts. And verse 44 that we just read said, so Moses declared to the children of Israel the feast of the Lord. So this feast and every other feast does not belong to the Jews or to any other group of people. It belongs to God. The feasts are appointed times that he has set apart to spend with his people. Meeting with him at these times won't save us, but they sure can be a blessing to those who do. I know that my family and I are always blessed. As I said, this is the 10th year that we have attempted to observe this holiday as a family, and this is the fifth year that we've gone camping at Moss Park. This eight-day celebration has become our favorite time of the year. Obviously, we don't celebrate it exactly according to Scripture. Uh, for example, we don't sacrifice any, any animals because Jesus has become our high priest. But we do our best to meet with God during this time because he has set it apart to meet with us. My level of participation has varied from year to year, depending on my work schedule and school schedule when I was taking classes. But if I haven't been able to do anything else during those eight days, I have tried to keep the Sabbaths on the first and eighth days. 
Most of us meeting here today believe that the seventh day of the week is a Sabbath that should be kept. That's why we're here. But there is more to keeping the Sabbath holy than just showing up for church. And the weekly seventh day Sabbath isn't the only day that God has set aside for us. In addition to the two that we just read about for the Feast of Tabernacles, God has set aside the first and seventh day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, uh, Pentecost, the Feast of Trumpets, and the Day of Atonement. The descriptions of these are found in Leviticus 23, and if you read them, you'll notice that you don't see the word Sabbath mentioned for Unleavened Bread and Pentecost. However, they do contain the two key components of a Sabbath. So let's take a look at those passages. Leviticus 23, 6 through 8 says, And on the fifteenth day of the first month, that twilight, is the feast of unleavened bread to the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation, and you shall do no customary work on it. But you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord for seven days. The seventh day shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. And then for Pentecost, Leviticus 23, verse 21 says, And you shall proclaim on the same day that it is a holy convocation to you. You shall do no customary work on it. It shall be a statute forever in all your dwellings throughout your generations. So the two key components for all of the Sabbaths that are listed in Scripture are holy convocation and doing no work or rest. In general, Christians don't have a problem with holy convocations. What we are doing right now is a holy convocation. Our songs, our prayer, and our study of scripture together as a body is a holy convocation because we're gathered here for the purpose of meeting with God. Christians of all denominations will have holy convocations. It's just that not many of them do it on the right day. What most Christians have a problem with is resting. And when I say most Christians, I'm including those who worship on Sabbath and those who keep the feast. Ironically, resting is something that most of us need to work on. The concept of rest was first introduced in Genesis 2, verses 1 through 3, which says, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished. And on the seventh day God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. The Hebrew word translated rested is Shabbat. Although it is a different word in Strong's Concordance from the word translated Sabbath, it is the same three Hebrew letters. The only difference is the vowel points. Uh, it means to desist from exertion to cease. So Shabbat or Sabbath by definition means to rest. And God chose the seventh day to celebrate this rest. God didn't, just, didn't stop creating after six days because he was tired and needed a break. He stopped because he was finished. There was nothing left for him to do. And he set the seventh day apart to be a blessing to us. In Mark 2.27, Jesus says that the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. This passage is referring to the weekly Sabbath, but I believe that the annual Sabbaths were also created for man to be a, for man to be a blessing to us. And it's interesting to me how much people resist and flat out disobey God's instructions for us to rest, because every person I know who works would like a day off from work. When I was in the Army, I had the same paid holidays that federal employees get. So I got New Year's Day, uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday, Washington's birthday, Memorial Day, Independence Day, Labor Day, Columbus Day, Veterans Day, Thanksgiving, and Christmas. And I didn't hear a single person complain about taking those days off. And no one was accused of being legalistic for taking those days off. God has given us the seventh day of every week to take off from work and to spend with him, plus an additional seven days each year, and hardly anyone will accept the invitation. And those who do are often accused of being legalistic. I don't understand why anyone would consider resting in God's presence to be a burden or a curse to be done away with. I personally thoroughly enjoy it. 
And yet I confess that I'm just as guilty as the next person in struggling to truly rest in God's presence at those appointed times. It was so important to God that people honor the Sabbath that he put it in what we call the Ten Commandments and he instituted the death penalty for breaking it. Let's look at Exodus 31, 13 through 17. Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbath you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. For whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. Work shall be done for six days, but the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Therefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So we are given an example of this uh, death penalty being enforced in Numbers 15, uh, 22 through 26, when a man is uh, found gathering sticks on the Sabbath. God commands him to be brought outside the camp and stoned, and so they do. Now I'm thankful that God has mercy on us so that we are no longer taken outside the camp and stoned for working on the Sabbath. That doesn't mean that the Sabbath is any less important to him now than it was then. The Sabbath is important because every Sabbath is an opportunity for us to disconnect from the world and reconnect with God. One of the biggest blessings for our family in going camping away from our home for the Feast of Tabernacles is that it forces us to unplug from the world. An average day at home is a struggle to keep the kids from having a screen in front of their face. But this is not an issue when we're camping. At home, we struggle to carve out time to read the Bible as a family. This past week, we've read the Bible with our friends every morning and every evening, and it wasn't a struggle to make it happen. I know from experience it can be hard for people with full-time jobs to get time off from work, and yet most employers give their full-time employees vacation time, and people take vacations. How many thousands of people got time off from their jobs this past week to come to Daytona Beach for Biketoberfest? How many thousands of people take time off from work each year to come to the races or to go to Disney or one of the other attractions in Central Florida? Millions of people take vacations and spend millions of dollars on being entertained. But if you ask those same people to take one day off each week and seven more days off each year to spend with God, most of them won't do it. They're either too busy or can't afford it. When we are too busy or can't afford to do something that God has asked us to do, then our priorities are messed up somewhere because God won't ask us to do something that is impossible to do. The owner of the business where Luke works is Jewish, and he tries to follow many of God's instructions, and yet he, he has the store open on Sabbath. He has said that he can't afford to be closed on Saturday. He doesn't think that honoring God in this is possible. And yet we see examples of businesses like Chick-fil-A and Hobby Lobby that are very successful, and yet they are closed on a day when all of their competitors are open. This society and culture in which we live makes it very difficult for us to honor God, but it's not impossible. When Judah returned to the land after being in captivity for 70 years, they rebuilt the temple and the wall, and then they settled into their cities. And even though Ezra read the book of the law to them at the Feast of Trumpets, and the people are convicted by it, and even though they celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, and that is followed by revival that leads to a covenant being sealed in which the people commit to honoring God, even though they do that, Nehemiah still has to institute some reforms that we read about in chapter 13, including reforms in regarding to keeping the Sabbath. We see that in verses 15 through 22. Oh. 
says, in those days I saw people in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in sheaves and loading donkeys with wine, grapes, figs, and all kinds of burdens which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I warned them about the day on which they were selling provisions. Men of Tyre dwelt there also, who brought in fish and all kinds of goods, and so sold them on the Sabbath to the children of Judah and in Jerusalem. Then I contended with the nobles of Judah and said to them, What evil thing is this that you do by which you profane the Sabbath day? Did not your fathers do thus, and did not our God bring all this disaster on us and on this city? Yet you bring added wrath on Israel by profaning the Sabbath. So it was at the gates of Jerusalem, as it began to be dark before the Sabbath, that I commanded the gates to be shut. Then I posted some of my servants at the gates, so that no burdens would be brought in on the Sabbath day. Now the merchants and sellers of all kinds of wares lodged outside Jerusalem once or twice. Then I warned them and said to them, Why do you spend the night around the wall? If you do so again, I will lay hands on you. From that time on, they came no more on the Sabbath. And I commanded the Levites that they should cleanse themselves, and that they should go and guard the gates to sanctify the Sabbath day. Remember me, O my God, concerning this also, and spare me according to the greatness of your mercy. So we're, we live in a society where it is common pr practice to do the equivalent of treading wine presses on the Sabbath. It is common practice even for those who worship on Saturday to buy and sell and conduct business on the Sabbath. This should not be. God is only asking for one day a week and seven more days throughout the year. It is not too difficult to accomplish everything that needs to be accomplished if we get our, our priorities straight. If you can't get everything done in the time that God has given you, then you are trying to do something that God has not asked you to do. And you have made whatever that thing is a higher priority than what God actually wants you to do. You don't have to have a full-time job in order to be too busy for God. There are many retired and unemployed people that just can't seem to find the time to do what God has called them to do. It is amazing how industrialization and technological advances have taken jobs away from people and supposedly made life easier, and yet many people still can't find time for God or their families. Our society and our families are being destroyed by many forms of evil, but one of the less obvious forms is busyness. When parents don't have time for their children, something is wrong. When we don't have time to read the Bible, but we have time for Facebook, something is wrong. When we have time to take a vacation to indulge the desires of our flesh, but we don't have time to take a day off to spend with God, something is wrong. I think we're all familiar with the story of Jesus visiting Mary and Martha in Luke 10, 38 through 42. Let's take a look at it. Now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. The Sabbath is our opportunity to sit down at the feet of Jesus and hear what he has to say to us. And yet we allow ourselves to become too busy and distracted, and we miss out on a tremendous blessing. In Matthew eleven twenty-eight through 30, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. It is not a burden to come to Jesus and rest. It is a delight. It is walking in our flesh instead of the Spirit that causes us to rebel and to want the things of this world more than the things of God. The Holy Spirit will lead us away from temptation and into God's rest, both physically and spiritually. In a moment, we'll be remembering the Last Supper that Jesus had with his disciples before his death. 
uh, before his death, burial, and resurrection. And it's in our bylaws that of this congregation to do this every three months on the th third Sabbath of the month. And so we're doing it today on the third Sabbath, uh, three months after doing it in July on the third Sabbath. What we're doing today is a tradition appointed by man is commemorating an important event, and it is important for us to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. But this is still a tradition of man. Not all traditions of men are bad, but they should never be more important to us than what God has set apart for us. Jesus died for our sins, but grace, but his grace is not licensed for us to sin and pick and choose which instructions we want to follow. By grace we have been saved through faith, not works, lest any man should boast. But resting is the opposite of work. So let's take advantage of every Sabbath and rest in the finished work of Jesus. Let's pray. Now, Father, we praise you for this Sabbath and every other Sabbath that you have set aside for us. Uh, Father, I pray that we would take advantage of these opportunities to rest in you. Uh, not because we have to for salvation, uh, but because there are blessings that you want to give us uh, through these appointed times. So, Father, I pray that we would uh, not be like Martha and miss out on those blessings, but I pray that we would be like Mary and sit at your feet and rest and allow you to speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen.